What a superb opportunity we have today to celebrate these two great figures in rural documentary photography, marking 50 years since each of them started work in Devon. And to use this occasion to examine a, a, a range of wider issues in that process. Am I right to use the tag rural? I have argued in the past that Revilius's work should be considered in the context of street photography to avoid it being marginalised as a dusty conservative outlier in 20th century photography, simply by being located in the countryside. On the other hand, by doing that I might thus be denying these artists an essential quality. After all, their context is rural and maybe this gives it a particular character. There are so many more questions that I'm looking forward to being answered this afternoon. So much to learn. Let's get the show on the road and introduce Chris Chapman as our first speaker. Um, Chris, you can start moving <laughs> towards me while I uh, talk about him. Um, one of the bonuses of being involved with this symposium has been the opportunity to meet and work with Chris, having long admired his work. It's a hackneyed expression, but in this case so appropriate. He needs no introduction to this audience. He's best known, perhaps, for his heartbreaking photo essay, Silence at Ranscliffe, so influential in highlighting the plight of British farmers during the fit and mouth epidemic. But this is just a small part of his immense output for 50 years, documenting life, rural life in Devon, Dartmoor. As you will hear, he was a close friend of James Revillius, and so is the <coughs> obvious choice to set the scene for us this morning. Chris, over to you. Good morning, everybody. I mean, it's lovely to see so many familiar faces in the audience, so I hope you find the next 25 minutes entertaining. I call this talk um, a photographic friendship, and I, as the talk goes on, I hope you will understand why. Certainly, um, photographers in the audience will be a little bit bemused by that, but the very first picture that I want to put up is a wonderful occasion last September at the home of the Revilliuses where the Devon History Society unveiled a blue plaque celebrating his life and his rich legacy contribution to the culture of North Devon. Robin Revilius mentioned, I was invited, and Robin <laughs> mentioned that if I arrived early I could go down to the house, and, which I duly did. And I was in a bit of a daze that morning. I hadn't, hadn't been to the house for quite a number of years. And um, my hand reached for what I thought was the doorbell cord. <laughs> and I was just about to pull it when my eyes went up. And I realised to my horror, had I pulled it, I would have taken the curtain down. James would have thought that absolutely hilarious. And here is a... a since organizing this, uh, this symposium, I've been going back through my archive looking for pictures of James. I, I thought I'd found them all, but in fact, uh, I've come across one or two new ones, which is a delight. But here we are in 1984 at Wisman's Wood. Um, I'm armed with a, a big Pentax 6x7, and James, I think, has his Leica, but also he was trying out I'm not sure this was the same day, but he was also trying out a Mamiya 645, not a camera that he would normally um, have enjoyed using. On one particular winter, 1984, he rang me. There'd been a wonderful fall of snow up on Darnwall, and he managed to get to the Tide Barn. I owned a, a Renault 4 in those days, a little, little white Renault 4, which is the most marvelous vehicle for going across the snow, a very light and very high revving engine. So you didn't need a 4x4. So he got to the Tide Barn, and off we set on an adventure. And that particular day, he was after a picture of a medieval cross on Dartmoor, which he said somebody wanted for a poetry book. We haven't been able to find this poetry book, but he wanted it for the cover of a book. And to my great surprise, I, I went back through all my contact sheets recording that day, and to my great surprise, here on the Beeford Archive website was this picture that James had taken of me photographing. And one of the first things that we came across was this father and son um, 
feeding silage to their stock up on Shapley Common. And I took a number of pictures. You see I'm quite close to the action. But actually that particular day, James, I felt, took the better picture. I congratulated him on this picture because I like the context of it. I like the fact that you can see it's a very, very deep valley as you go up onto the common. And I love the way he just captured Martin's arm and not obscured by the tree. So for me, that was a better picture. And we come back to that idea of photographic friendship. Well, photography demands that you work on your own. I often equate it to being very similar to that of the hunter, you know, after, after the, the rabbit or the deer or the fish. And you do not want anybody else tagging along with you. It's a very solitary occupation. But with James, there was something about James. We weren't competitive. We could go out together, and we did go out on quite a number of, of, of forays. Never got in each other's way, respected each other, and sometimes I would come away with the prize, sometimes he would come away with the prize. Chris. And on this particular day, Thanks. am I on the wrong one? In, one. One. in the middle. <laughs> right, now you tell me. <laughs> on this particular one, uh, we'd gone to the very first cross, which is one of my favourites, Seward's Cross, sometimes known as Nun's Cross, um, right up on the top of Dartmoor near Princetown. And it was bitterly cold, and we had quite a long walk from the car. And just for a very brief, literally few seconds, that wintry sun poked through the clouds. And I had a 35mm camera, so I was fine, shooting from the hip, and got two or three shots. If you look there on the horizon, there is a figure. And this figure got closer and closer, and poor James was fiddling away with this what he called dreadful Mamiya. He really didn't like that camera, and was, I think he was trying to load it anyway. He wasn't ready. And this old boy reached us and asked us what we were doing. And I said, oh, we're trying to photograph this, this ancient cross. And without further ado, he marched over to it with his stick and said, oh, that old cross been there years, and knocked all the snow and ice off. <laughs> <laughs> And we were absolutely horrified. And when he'd gone, I mean, I took this picture of James when he'd gone. And uh, it was just, it, I think the funniest sight would have been James and I trying to stick that snow. We did try to <laughs> stick that snow and ice back onto the, onto the cross and failed miserably. But later on that day, um, I took him to Bennett's Cross on the way back, which is very close to the road. And he got his prize. And I do remember, he showed me the picture, and I do remember the book, but I can't tell you now who the poet was or, or what the circumstances were. But again, a photographic friendship. You see how we're both respecting each other. There aren't my footprints in there. I've worked my way around while he chose the, the shot. Now this I came across just literally two weeks ago. I was searching through my archive and I found this picture of James with his beret on. And incidentally, people have often asked me, why did he wear a beret? Um, well, if you'd been with Liz and I at a concert not, not very long ago, there was a mu musician photographer and he was wearing a baseball cap. And I nudged Liz and I said, watch when he takes pictures. He turned the baseball cap, cap the other way around so the peak didn't hit the camera. And that's why James would, would have worn a beret. Two reasons, keep his head warm, but also would never get in the way of, of, of the viewfinder. So I could not work out where I'd taken this picture. And I realized that there was a very deep valley behind. So I thought, oh, well, maybe it is on Dartmoor. But in the old days of film, of course, you had your contact sheet. So I studied the contact sheet. And the very first image before I started photographing James was this, this Methodist chapel. So I scanned the image, that's the beauty of today, you can scan your negative rather than having to go into the dark room, blew the image up, found out the name of the chapel on the image, rang Robin, she told me that it was in the parish of Dalton, although somewhere out from the village. And uh, I then Googled, what, I love this picture actually, you know, this is an extraordinary thing about the passage of time that's recorded a moment in time, it's recorded the culture of the region at that time. And I googled the chapel, and that's what I came up with. And what, for me, that's just an extraordinary leap in time.
I love, I, we've, there's been a little steering group who work behind the scenes uh, from this symposium, busy putting together a book. It wasn't my idea, so I thought it was a wonderful idea. And edited by Mark Howarth Booth, they've done 25 pairings of our pictures. So 25 of mine, 25 of James's. And um, to begin with, I made lots of suggestions and they all got thrown out the door, so that was fine. And they came up with this, just this wonderful collection. Um, we had hoped to have the book ready today, but uh, it, it, won't, it won't be ready now until the end of October. But this is, this is the cover. And um, I think what it's, what it's showing you is that we both had certainly a, a, a sense of humor with our, with our photographs. That's not to say, James wouldn't, had he been alive, wouldn't have documented the foot and mouth crisis in North Devon. Of course he would have done. But he was, he was a very humorous chap, very gentle chap. And he, he certainly, certainly could see the funny side when taking, taking pictures without actually taking the mickey out of people. And this one illustrates it for me perfectly. And we've all, as photographers, we've all done this, where he'd gone out early one morning to, to photograph John Moyes bottle feeding his lambs. And he'd made this print. And I, I remember being in his dark room when he showed it to me. And he said, I call this the tripod. Which <laughs> 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 was a wonderful, wonderful picture. And, in a way, that, to me, strengthens that picture. That makes that picture even... It, it stopped it being just a document of a farmer bottle feeding his lambs. It's actually done something else. It's added James's sense of humour, the fact that he could call that, title that, the tripod. And I have one very similar where I try to photograph in the pouring rain this farm labourer, Brian Mortimer, who I knew very well with his colleague down at Chyford Bridge. And every time I tried to get the collie to sit on the wall, the collie kept going over and licking his face. And then this sudden moment in time where Brian had suddenly said to the dog, look at the bloody camera. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was the image, perfect image. And another visit to Wisman's Wood in 1997, this sadly two, two years before James died. And by this time, he got very interested in the minute eye of life. He wasn't suddenly, suddenly wasn't doing the, the bigger picture. He was looking at nature in, 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 in sharp detail. And I rather admired him for that. That's not something that I think I, even now, I would, I would dream of doing. But he was very, getting very interested in using a much larger format camera. And I'd gone up with him that day. I wasn't particularly inspired went up to the top of the wood on my own, came back, and then I spotted him. And I just thought that was lovely. And as you can see, um, my homage to him is, like I said, James Revillius photographing in Wisman's Wood, Dartmoor, a man of the cloth. <laughs> Another occasion uh, where we went with a much larger camera, I think this, is, this was probably an MPP 5x4, up on top of Hookney Tor, and um, I gave Robin and Ella uh, a copy of this because I thought actually it's possibly, I don't think it's a great photograph, it does show him at work. But to my great surprise, just a fortnight ago, I found this picture, which I was just so thrilled to have. I mean, it's technically struggling a little bit on 35 mil with the very grainy clouds, but it does show you James at work. I was really, really pleased to have found that. And one of, the, one of the, my favorite pictures of James is James was always after this, this, what he called this sort of silvery, silvery light. And he would often go out early in the morning to try and, and capture that. And he would spend hours on the telephone to me. Have you tried this developer? Have you tried this, that developer? Have you tried this paper? Have you tried this lens? And um, reading Robin Revillius's biography, you know, he even got one gentleman to take the multi-coating off a lens to, to cause in, uh, in sort of a certain internal flare, which would give you a much longer tonal range. He was always after that very long tonal range in his pictures. He wasn't interested in black white, which some photographers are. He, he had this, this theory that every shadow 
was luminous, you could read into every shadow. So trying to achieve that in his prints was, was paramount to James. And I understood that, and in 2017, I got this picture, which is actually just on, on very close to where I live, about a mile from where I live. And I would have so loved to have been able to share that with James. I think he, 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 would, he would have been delighted at the fact that I'd managed to achieve that. So the, the pairings go on. This is another pairing from uh, the new book, A Photographic Friendship. Um, lady on the left is a great friend of mine, Maggie Clark, who passed away uh, earlier this year feeding Lazarus. I think I'm right in saying Lazarus had been bitten by a fox and then uh, survived. So she called him Lazarus, mm -hmm. rather nice. And Archie Barkhouse, if those of you who are familiar with James's work, lived just down the road from their cottage uh, uh, at Addisford in Dalton. And I, I, you know, I can under those wonderful pictures of Archie with, with that, that trust, you know, a true countryman trusting James with a camera to photograph him. And there is this fantastic body of work, very personal pictures of Archie, but you can see that it, it, it's common, what I would call common consent, you know, the, the subject matter is absolutely at ease with the photographer. And I've used that rule throughout my working career, is that you don't push into private lives, you've got to wait until you're made welcome. And revealing a little bit about, about James, when I, when I first went to the cottage at, uh, at Dalton in the, in the early 1980s, um, I was horrified at his working practice. In fact, I told him off because he would, he would work away at his dark room and if a print wasn't right, he would just throw it under the bench. And the photographers in this audience old enough will know that dreadful smell of fix on a, on a photographic paper when it's starting to decompose. It's quite a powerful, strong, strong smell. And um, towards the end of his life, he, he, he did start to clean up his act, which I was quite, quite pleased to, to see. And uh, he proudly showed me this extraordinary Heath Robinson that he, he, he'd built. And James was always fiddling with things, fiddling with his cameras, taking a hacksaw to them, fiddling with hi-fi, building, building hi-fi. And he put a Morphe Richards um, hairdryer without the element outside the darkroom, connected to a pipe, a flexible hose, connected to his mask so that he didn't have to breathe in the chemicals when he was printing. And if you notice, um, the, the pictures tell you one or two things. There's a copy of Hi-Fi something or other there. I can't see it at this angle. And he was using a cold cathode De Vere enlarger. That's a 5x4, which um, I had one of those. found them quite irritating because you never, you could never actually... Uh, you could write down how long it took you to print something, and then the next time you came to fire it up, it would be completely different. So I, I ditched it in the end, but James used one, and then the famous little lights, 35mm uh, camera. And a nice personal picture, another visit to Wisman's Wood. And that's, I think that's probably the only picture I have of James and Robin together, but I love the picture. I think it's a very, very tender picture watching how I'm doing for time. And this little sequence amuses me no end. Again, it's only in recent times that I found this sequence. Um, this is a visit to um, the cottage. And there's James and Robin and little Ella. I have no idea where Ben was that day. I don't remember. Ben doesn't appear in my contact sheet, so I don't know where he was. School, he would have been in school. Oh, well, there you are. There we are. Anyway, um, why I love this next sequence is that um, I often pull James's legs about him using a Leica, although I have to say the wonderful man who taught me, David Hearn, who's in the audience, he certainly <laughs> used a Leica. It didn't seem to mind his students using SLRs, but David always used a Leica. Cartier Bresson, of course, used a Leica. And James loved his Leica. And I used to pull his leg and say, look, you, you know, with a 35mm SLR, you can shoot from the hip. It's so much quicker, it's so much quicker. <laughs> and in the, in, the, in the garden or the orchard at uh, Addisford, 
he challenged me. He said, watch this. And I took this sequence <laughs> on, my, on my Olympus. So it's, it, it's, I've seen something. I pulled the lens out of my bag. I've taken the picture there. And then another one of how he would use, it's a different lens on there actually, but how he would use this little, uh, little viewfinder on top of the Leica. I mean, I love that sequence. Just go back a minute. <laughs> Especially that one. I've seen something. There we are. So that was, that's a lovely record for me to have. And I mentioned earlier on, we, we, we went through a, a, a very difficult period, James and I, where in, in, in the world of photography, people were starting to say, that we were just sentimental ruralists. This was a label that we were given. And uh, I was very friendly with a, a gentleman called Stephen Hobson, who's since emigrated to Australia, but I keep in touch with Stephen. And at the time, he was head of, South, he was photographer officer at Southwest Arts. And he rang me one day and he said, you know, Chris, he said, the, the trouble with you and James is that you're just not cutting edge. And he wasn't saying that in a, in a nasty way. He was just saying that, you know, as, as, as rural photographers, you're not deemed important. But does that matter? I don't think it does. I think all photographers, you, the, the first thing that you should do as a photographer, if you're going to be serious about photography, is go out and photograph what you love. It's got to come from within here. And James clearly loved the countryside, he clearly loved the people of North Devon, and I think that's probably why we met, you know, that he could see that I was working on Dartmoor and doing almost exactly the same thing. And as I say, he had, had he lived to see foot and mouth, he would, have, um, he would have grappled with that and documented it in just the same way as I did. And in fact, I have to thank Beeford um, for um, actually organising that commission through, you know, the, because James wasn't there to do it, you know, they immediately thought of me. And uh, that, uh, that those few months, those horrific months of 2001, I got to task and centred my story actually on a farm in Beeford of all places, Ramsliff Farm. But as I say, he did photograph the other side of rural life that a lot of people don't see. I mean, I find this very familiar. I'm not so sure a photographer would be let anywhere near a scene like this today, despite hunting bound, I mean, foxes do still get killed. Um, but I'm just interested to pair these two together, this one of mine, of a hunted stag on Exmoor in 1991, and this one of the huntsman cutting off the fox's brush, which is deemed a prize once you've, once you've hunted the fox to the kill. He wasn't squeamish. And again, they don't, you know, they, you, you look at these pictures and you think, well, why did we take them? You know, it's just a man digging his vegetable plot. But it actually records a, an extraordinary moment in time. And one of, the, one of the things I thought culturally was really interesting is if you look at a lot of aerial photographs taken by sky views in general of Leeds in the 1960s of the farms, you know, they used to come around and try and sell you the picture. Everybody's got a vegetable patch. If you went and did it today, you'll hardly see a vegetable patch. Maybe that will come back, but where the vegetable patch is, is now lawn, it's recreation. It's not actually connected to the house, to the rural economy. So that, I find that quite interesting. So we turned the camera on it. So here's mine of Charlie Mead, and here's James, uh, somebody digging a vegetable plot in North Loo in Devon. Very similar pictures. And again, that, that, that friendship, and I remember this conversation because um, I think I'm right, I think, yes, it was, James was publishing The Corner of England. Was that right, Robin? Does this go on the jacket for, it's, it, it, he, he used this picture of this portrait on the jacket of The Corner of England. I think it's on, it? the, back, yeah. think it's on the back on the jacket. <laughs> And the conversation was at the time, well, you do my portrait, I'll do yours. <laughs> so we, we wandered up to Ash Green, just above my house, and uh, took these pictures. And again, going through, I use this one in my book, Wild Goose, and that's on the jacket of Wild Goose and Ridden in, in 2000, uh, a year after James died. But um, 
oh, I come to this one. Um, it took me a long time. To, I don't know what year this was erected, but this is a beautiful um, memorial to James in the graveyard of uh, St. James's Church in, uh, in Iddersley. And um, it, it faces north and it gets the early morning dew, as you can imagine. So it's quite difficult to photograph. But my son was busy doing, my youngest son was busy doing 10 tours. So after I delivered him at five o'clock in the morning, I shot up there and managed to get the light on, on, on it when it had dried off. Well worth visiting. And one of James's favorite places, and the place that he photographed a lot, is, is in the parish of Iddesley. And again, I recently found this picture, and actually it's the same time as going up to Ash Green to do each other's portraits. And I think that captures his, his, his that boyishness about James. You know, James, James was 60 when he died. I never, I never, he was, he was like, almost like, a, not a twin brother, but all, I always felt he was the same age as me. Um, there was something very um, boyish and humorous about him. And it was just a delight to be with. And that captures his character, enjoying a sharp black brick. And this, strangely, is my favourite photograph of him of all time. And it's in colour. I can't understand why it's in colour. I, I can't understand why I had colour film in my camera. I do know that Peter Beecham was with us that day because we were, we were going off to look at a, a medieval chapel in the parish of Gidley that Peter was interested in, in the listing of. And uh, James is using Edwin Smith's um, Ica camera here. Um, I'm not, I don't think I've ever seen the photographs that he took that day, but that for me says all you need to know about my friend James Rebellious. Thank you very much.